This may be our starting. Okay, that sounds good. Morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's uh, 12, and I think we're going to begin. Today's topic uh, is, uh, I guess, different types of or different presentations of meningitis be presented by Dr. Chris Bach from the Division of Neurology. Chris. All right, thank you. All right, so thanks, Dr. Casson. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know me, so my name is Chris Walk. So I'm a uh, new uh, new hire here in neurology. I just finished uh, residency here at uh, UBC last summer, so I've been here about a year now. Uh, so I've seen some of you on the, on the ward. Um, so, um, so yeah, I've been asked to come and talk, and I decided to talk about um, uh, meningitis and a few different cases. Um, I think all these cases are from from my residency, um, but uh, three different uh, presentations. Um, and uh, if, for, if anybody was in my noon rounds back in January, I apologize. It's going to be a bit of a refresher for you, but uh, I think most of the people here weren't at that one. So, um, in any case, so I'll, I'll go through the three cases. So the first case, um, so there's a, a male. Um, I think I have the age on the next slide, but he presented with uh, onset of fever about uh, uh, 38.5 measured um, and a headache about two days prior. Uh, he felt that he was, uh, his wife felt that he was more sleepy than normal, but otherwise was his typical self. Uh, he went and saw his family doctor that morning uh, who said that it was probably the flu, uh, febrile illness, and sent him home. Uh, later that day, however, he uh, became much more confused. Uh, he was unable to carry on conversation with his wife. And, uh, and then when he got up to go to the bathroom, he couldn't walk. He felt off balance um, and began to complain of double vision. So at that point, his wife uh, promptly called uh, the ambulance who came uh, and brought him to here to St. Paul's. Um, now, I think I actually deleted the slide that said his age, but he's, I think he's 56. Um, so he had a, a past history of ulcerative colitis. And so he's, he was on treatment with prednisone, uh, mercaptopurine, and mesalazine. Uh, he also had a history of dyslipidemia. He was being treated with rosuvastatin and diabetes, which was diet controlled at that point. When he came into the emergency department, his initial temperature was 39.4. Uh, and uh, my initial examination of him showed that he was drowsy, 
Uh, he was rousable to voice. Um, he was oriented uh, times three, um, but he was unable to provide any clear history of what had happened over the past two days. Uh, when I tested his cognition a bit more formally, he was unable to follow three-step commands or perform any common attention tasks, like even serial threes or months backwards. Um, and that was essentially the extent of what he was able to participate in the mental status. In terms of uh, the remainder of his examination, the one finding was that he had limited abduction of the left eye, uh, and uh, as well as meningismus. Uh, the remainder of the motor exam was normal. His sensory examination was limited due to participation, but otherwise normal. There was some, uh, some past pointing on finger-nose testing, and that improved when he closed one of his eyes. So presumably it was secondary to the diplopia. Uh, gait was not assessed initially. So his initial investigations uh, included a white count of uh, 7.2, um, a low sodium, uh, blood cultures were drawn, uh, but were pending when I saw him. And he'd had a CT head and a CT uh, with contrast uh, that had been done, which were both normal. Um, so after assessing him, we, uh, I proceeded to do lumbar puncture. And that showed uh, an opening pressure of 45. And the CSF, so that's elevated. So the normal pressure would be uh, around 20 or below. And the CSF was yellow or straw colored. And so empirically, at that point, we, he was diagnosed with meningitis, and he was covered uh, fairly broad-spectrum antibiotics. Uh, so he was covered with ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and ampicillin uh, for bacterial meningitis. And the ampicillin was added uh, because of his history of immunosuppression with ulcerative colitis. Um, and he was covered with acyclovir. And then again, because of this question of immunosuppression, he was um, started on uh, uh, fungal therapies. So um, his initial lumbar puncture results came back with an elevated white count of 156. And it was predominantly neutrophil, so fitting with a profile of a bacterial meningitis. Uh, he also had elevated red cells. Uh, glucose was in the normal range. And then protein was elevated at 1.5 grams. Um, and uh, initial gram stain showed um, neutrophils, monocytes, but no organism. So uh, this, was, this is just a single um, scan, uh, an MRI, just a representative slice showing that there was nothing to be seen on the, on the MRI. It was normal. So um, the next day, some of the other lab results uh, started to trickle in. Uh, so his virology uh, was negative, uh, VDRL was negative, uh, cryptococcal antigen negative, fungal culture negative, AFB stain took a bit longer, but negative. And then he ended up having a positive CSF culture, which grew listeria. And then subsequently also the blood cultures grew listeria as well. And so he was diagnosed with uh, uh, essentially a, a listeria meningitis. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, listeria. Um, so it's a gram-positive um, facultative anaerobic bacteria. And it was first isolated uh, back in 1918 from a soldier with meningitis. Uh, but the first uh, outbreak was actually in 1981. Um, and uh, can I, does anybody recognize that city there? Yeah, so that's, that's Halifax. Yeah, that's where I'm from, actually. But uh, so in 1981, there was the first uh, outbreak that was linked to a food source. Um, uh, uh, and so that's when it, it became more, of a, more common, uh, commonly thought of. So this is a review from about 2011. And this is, I know you can't read all this, so I'm going to break it down a little bit. But this is a, a study, um, uh, does it have the years on there? I can't remember the exact years, but it's a study of over about seven years looking at um, the number of cases of uh, hospitalizations and illnesses that can be attributed to a foodborne um, organism. And uh, so it's listing the number of cases, number of hospitalizations, number of deaths. Um, and that's another big table. But I, what I want to do is, is kind of break it down and show you where listeria fits into that. So of the total um, number, so of annual infections, there are about 9 million, just over 9 million that could be attributed to foodborne illness. Now, of those, the most common was norovirus, which accounts for more than half of the foodborne illnesses, um, and then salmonella, clostridium as the top three. And listeria falls much farther down, uh, only number 24 on the, on the list, with about just about a, uh, 1,500 cases in the year. So much, uh, you know, very small percentage, as you can see, 0.02%. Now, the thing about listeria, though, is that it, it's much more severe illness than norovirus. And uh, so if we look at the number of hospitalizations um, related to these, 
Um, you can see Listeria now is about uh, is number seven on that list, accounting for just over two percent of hospitalizations. And the actual hospitalization rate, so people who develop Listeria that require hospitalization, is, is 94 percent, so quite a high percentage. And if we look at the annual mortality rate related to these illnesses, Listeria is actually number three, accounting for almost 20 percent of deaths related to uh, foodborne illness. So even though it makes up a very small percentage of total infections, it's got a significant mortality rate. And its, it's, it's mortality rate itself is about 16%. So uh, where does listeria come from? Well, it, it typically comes from food exposure, as I've, as I've mentioned. And this is a study looking at different foods and identifying uh, the risk of developing listeria from that food. So you can see commonly it will be associated with soft cheeses, um, deli meats um, uh, in particular. Um, and I'm just going to, that again shows a similar pattern. So you can see that um, with uh, dairy products, the, uh, it's, it's much higher um, uh, risk of developing listeria. So, what are, so obviously we encounter uh, eat, you know, soft cheeses, meats um, throughout our life, and what are the risk factors for developing uh, this illness? Um, and so there's a study here uh, looking at uh, in non-pregnant individuals who develop listeriosis. Um, and looking at some of their other comorbid conditions. And uh, what you can see um, on this side is it, it lists a, uh, any comorbid condition that uh, they identified. So heart disease, steroid therapy, cancer, et cetera. Um, and so there are several different uh, conditions that were associated with it. Uh, but uh, coming out of that, essentially, um, you know, immunosuppression uh, is, is a, a key, obviously. And then it's a higher risk in pregnant women, neonates, and, and older adults. So how does uh, listeria present within the central nervous system? So it typically has three main presentations. So the first is very essentially what, uh, what our patient presented with. is a meningoencephalitis. And they can present with uh, a subacute onset, fever, headache, mental status change, the typical features you think of with, with any meningitis. But they may have focal neurologic signs. Now, listeria preferentially will affect at the brain stem, and that's uh, rhomboencephalitis. And it's actually one of the, it is the most common infectious cause of, of infection in the brain stem. And when it uh, involves that region of the brain, you can often see associated cranial nerve abnormalities or cerebellar findings. And in our case, our patient presented with uh, a sixth nerve palsy with the diplopia on, on lateral gaze. Uh, and then finally, rarely it can present with brain abscess, um, and that again will present with a will um, involve a focal neurologic deficit. So, ultimately, there's there's no specific clinical feature that distinguishes listeria as uh, from other types of meningitis, and so the diagnosis really needs to be suspected in the presence of certain risk factors, so immunosuppression or uh, age or advanced age. And then the diagnosis is established with the positive CSF cultures. So, and treatment. Um, so listeria is not susceptible to cephalosporins, and there are failures with vancomycin. And so the first line is, is either ampicillin or penicillin. Um, and then with a confirmed diagnosis, gentamicin can be added uh, for a synergistic effect. And in this patient's case, uh, he was treated with both ampicillin and, and gentamicin. If there's an allergy, uh, then uh, septra can be used. And uh, the duration of therapy um, should be, is, is quite long. So for an immunocompetent individual, uh, it would be up to, up to four weeks. For immunocompromised, it should be up to two months of, uh, of antibiotic therapy. And uh, you can follow it up with uh, repeat CSF analysis to ensure that the organism has been cleared. So going back a little to the prognosis of listeria, so this is a study from uh, about 25 years ago. And uh, so this actually looked at the mortality rate um, in patients uh, diagnosed with uh, a rhomboencephalitis. And so what you can see here is that if the patients were not treated, then their survival rate was zero. So if 16 patients didn't receive appropriate antibiotic therapy, um, they, uh, all of them uh, uh, died. Now, if you included ampicillin uh, or, or penicillin, then the survival rate is about 76%. And so it jumps up significantly. If they were treated um, just with empiric antibiotic coverage but didn't include ampicillin, then the survival rate you see is 40%. So there's some benefit, but clearly uh, still a significant mortality rate. So um, 
it's important to think of that and, and add that antibiotic when there's any potential of listeria. So this is a, an interesting study that actually followed up cases of uh, listeriosis, uh, listeria meningitis, and, uh, and monitored their mortality rate over time. And so what you can see is, uh, hopefully you can see that clearly. So this um, solid line is, the, uh, is essentially the death rate of the uh, population controls. And so um, the dashed line you can actually see is that, um, so essentially this is the number of surviving individuals. So you can see that the people who have had a diagnosis of listeria meningitis have a higher mortality rate over the subsequent um, uh, 20 years of that study. And when they looked at different uh, medical conditions, what they showed is this is the cumulative rate, cumulative rate of cancer. And again, these are the controls. And then these are the patients who had previous history of listeria meningitis. And you can see that their, their cancer rate is actually higher than the control population. And again, this is in table form looking at the same thing um, and showing that the mortality rate over the next five years compared to controls is at 2.63. So it's a significantly higher mortality rate. Um, and this is looking at um, cause-specific mortality rate. And so you can see cancer uh, has a 3.8 uh, increased risk um, in, in those, uh, those patients who had the diagnosis of listeria. And so the, the, the take-home from that is that um, the, these patients do develop um, different malignancies at a higher rate than the normal population. And it may be that that was the underlying predisposition for, for developing listeria in the first place. And so um, it would be pertinent to at least think about screening them for common malignancies after being diagnosed with listeria. So uh, kind of the epilogue of this case uh, was the patient did receive um, ampicillin and gentamicin and was discharged home about a month after admission. And so he did well. His only residual deficit was uh, a resolving sixth nerve palsy, and he was to follow up with ophthalmology. And so he was a positive result from a potentially significant uh, illness. Um, so I'll move on to, to case two. Now, this case, um, this happened at Burnaby Hospital, actually. So um, I was uh, there on a, a, a rotation at that time. And so this uh, was a 19-year-old student. Uh, he moved from China about two years prior to this assessment. And about two months earlier, he began to complain of symptoms of sore throat and fevers uh, that would reach up to 39 uh, C at home. So he was referred to an internist as an outpatient and who uh, performed uh, extensive workup. Uh, part of that workup included blood cultures, which were negative, um, but he did have elevated CRP. And so that workup also included a CT chest, which showed a pleural effusion and some patchy infiltrates. And so he was brought in uh, to Burnaby Hospital actually for a bronchoscopy. Um, and uh, he'd come in, I think, just three days. Yeah, there you go, three days before I saw him. So he'd had normal mental status throughout the two months, uh, just the, the intermittent fevers. Um, and then and he had normal mental status throughout the first three days of his admission. So on that morning, we were called to see him, and he'd, he'd appeared a bit more confused um, with his nurse, and he typically would call, had, would call his parents every morning to let them know what was happening for that day, and he'd forgotten to call his parents that day. So we were called, and I went in to assess him because uh, of the mental status change. And as I, was, uh, he, as I was gowning up to go into his room, a code blue was called and he, for decreased level of consciousness and hypotension. And so he ended up being urgently intubated and transferred to the ICU. So I was never able to actually examine him uh, prior to that. So his exam was uh, limited um, due to sedation and intubation, um, but after the sedation was removed, his exam was essentially showed these findings. So he, his eyes would open spontaneously, not to command, not to pain, and his pupils were dilated, non-reactive. There's no verbal output. He was not obeying any commands, um, and he would move his limbs spontaneously um, and, and was strong but wouldn't participate. And essentially, he stayed in, in this state for several months from that, from that episode. No improvement. So um, his initial blood work uh, at the time showed normal blood counts, uh, uh, normal CRP. Um, and the CT head had this question of a mild hydrocephalus. A lumbar puncture was performed, uh, which showed normal opening pressure. Again, the fluid was yellowish, 
um, elevated white cells, again, a bacterial um, pattern with uh, mainly uh, neutrophils. Um, and the protein was, uh, was significantly elevated now at, at more than five grams. And this is his imaging. So hopefully everyone can see the abnormality on that scan. So this is a contrast MRI scan. And what you can see here is enhancement uh, through the basal meninges um, uh, around the brain stem and into the temporal lobes. And you can see it extends up higher. So this is a diffuse kind of leptomeningeal process and extending all the way up to the uh, parietal lobes. And this just shows you uh, the pre- and, and post-contrast um, enhancement. There's a little bit of Beauchamp artifact in the, the contrast one. And on uh, sagittal view, what you can see here is the uh, meningeal enhancement is nicely outlining both the pons, um, the cerebellum, and extending up into the leptum meninges. So quite an extensive process. So um, as part of his investigations, he did have mycobacterial workup. And so he had an AFB smear done, but it, the report came back as insufficient, insufficient specimen on that first uh, uh, LP. And it was sent for culture. So he sent it off on May 15th, the day he, uh, he was seen. And the culture returned on July 3rd as positive, so two months down the road for uh, TB. So clinically, it wasn't the most useful test at the time, but, uh, but it did confirm his diagnosis. So, he, so when we initially saw him, we suspected tuberculous uh, TB meningitis, um, and he was treated with uh, multiple agents for that. And he was also given pulse uh, methylprednisolone for five days. Um, he was uh, then transferred ultimately to Vancouver General because of hydrocephalus that had developed, and he required placement of a lumbar drain and uh, ultimately a shunt to manage that. So I'll talk a little bit about tuberculosis and, and evidence for treatment. So as we know, there's a global distribution of tuberculosis, and in this map it highlights uh, the, the more endemic areas in sub-Saharan Africa and in, the, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so it's uh, an aerobic bacillus. Um, it does not hold, the, the cell wall will not hold a gram stain, so it requires a special stain for it. And uh, humans are the only known reservoir, um, as far as I know. Somebody can correct me on that one. But, um, and uh, it's an intracellular, uh, uh, intracellular organism. So the important risk factors for tuberculosis um, are, uh, again, immunosuppression. So it's an opportunistic infection in HIV. And so um, your risk of developing uh, TB meningitis is much higher uh, in, in HIV-positive individuals compared to uh, controls, so 10 versus 2%. And so uh, when you do have a case of TB meningitis, they should be screened for HIV because it's, it's, uh, it's a significant uh, risk factor. And it can be reactivated uh, with, when patients are put on immunosuppression. And so... Prior to immunosuppression, we should screen, as I'm sure we all do, uh, looking for, uh, uh, for evidence of previous infection. So how does it infect the CNS? And so typically it, 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 it starts with a bacteremia, um, and then it will spread and seed the meninges or the brain itself. And what can actually happen is you get this development of a small region of, of infection uh, called a rich focus, and then that can then rupture into the subarachnoid space and cause that disseminated infection throughout the leptin meninges. And that can be a sudden kind of a progression. So, the, uh, so CNS tuberculosis is split up into, uh, well, the meningitic, meningitis portion of it is split into three stages. So the first stage uh, is lucid, no focal neurologic deficits. So it will be very hard to diagnose that as a TB meningitis in that stage. Uh, stage two is when they begin to develop lethargy, confusion, mild neurologic deficits. And then stage three, which is essentially where he was when I first assessed him, there is delirium, coma, seizures, hemiplegia, so significant neurologic deficits. Uh, occasionally, it can, uh, it can also present as a tuberculoma, so a focus of, of infection, um, or it can present as an arachnoiditis affecting the spinal nerves. And that can cause a polyradiculopathy or a myelopathy. So how do you make the diagnosis of CNS tuberculosis? Well, just like with listeria, um, the symptoms are not specific. And so you can see these are uh, clinical findings in patients with TB meningitis. You see the, the top ones are headache, fever, vomiting, confusion. So 
a classic presentation. So there's no clinical way um, in terms of symptoms that we can distinguish. You can get a clue if you're seeing kind of lung abnormalities of a, of a TB infection. And you can also, with fundoscopy, you can see um, these uh, choroidal uh, changes um, that are associated with, uh, uh, that are t uh, tubercles um, that can uh, identify that condition. So the real way to make the diagnosis is through CSF. And so this is a study going uh, way back to 1979. And this is looking at the utility of uh, serial lumbar punctures in identifying the organism. And so what they showed here is that with, uh, uh, with the first lumbar puncture uh, on just the microscopy, so a smear, your chance of uh, detecting a TB is about 37%. On culture, about 52%. With subsequent uh, lumbar punctures, so you increase that yield significantly. And so if you end up doing four serial punctures, then your detection rate is about 87%. So the standard recommendation was from that time on is to do serial lumbar punctures if you're highly suspicious of this to confirm the diagnosis. Um, nucleic acid amplification is available, uh, so PCR uh, for TB, um, and it has a bit of a higher yield. But again, you may need a repeat uh, um, lumbar punctures to, uh, to confirm this. And then on imaging, some things that you might see uh, are listed there. And so essentially what will happen, as you saw in this patient, is you can get inflammation of the basal meninges, so near the, the pons and, and the base of the brain. And what that can do is it can affect the blood vessels and cause a vasculitis, which will lead to strokes. So you may see evidence of, of, of vasculitic uh, infarcts. Um, it can cause... Um, uh, it, it can cause uh, difficulty of the CSF leaving through the arachnoid granulations, and so you can develop a non-communicating hydrocephalus, which is what our patient developed, um, and, and cerebral edema also. And so this kind of shows that, going back to that table, so as it ruptures and affects the meninges, you can have adhesions leading to hydrocephalus. You can have inflammation around the cranial nerves leading to cranial nerve palsies affecting the blood vessels, causing stroke and, and vasculitis, and then causing the encephalitis. So the treatment is typically, so induction therapy, um, and I, I don't know how this differs uh, from uh, just standard treatment of TB, but induction therapy with, with multiple agents. One of the keys is that ethambutol, which is typically used, does not penetrate the CSF, and so it should be substituted with, with one of uh, fluoroquinolone or, or aminoglycoside. And then maintenance therapy up to a year. Uh, if there's a tuberculoma um, within the brain, then it should be a year and a half. And if it's drug resistance, up to two years um, of treatment. So uh, as I mentioned, we treated this patient with pulse steroids. And so what are the role, what's the role of steroids in TB meningitis? So even with steroids, the mortality rate is very high, um, but, uh, but it is better than, than without. And so the mortality rate is, is still 20 to 30 percent with steroids. And so the proposed benefit is to reduce that inflammation um, that I mentioned in the basal meninges, so preventing the complications of hydrocephalus, vasculitis, etc. Um, the risk is that it will further lower the immune system and, and potentially um, uh, uh, worsen the infection. But this is, uh, this is kind of uh, meta-analysis looking at different studies that have assessed as, uh, steroids in the setting of uh, TB meningitis. And so what you can see is on the left, this is favoring steroids. And on the right, this is uh, favoring uh, not treating with steroids. So the top graph uh, is for um, uh, the outcome, primary outcome of death. And so you can see the summary is slightly on the side of favoring steroids. And if you include death or disabling neurologic deficit, again, it's slightly on the uh, favoring steroids. And there's no particular regimen. These are different studies. They use different doses of steroids, IV, oral. Um, but the, the ultimate uh, take home is that there may be some benefit um, uh, from that. And the, the typical, as I said, it's not being studied formally, but the typical steroid dosing would be um, a, a tapering course of, uh, of either dexamethasone or prednisone. So how about surgery? So um, there's a few role. Uh, uh, indications for surgery. So one is what we saw in this patient is he developed hydrocephalus that required the placement of a, of a shunt. Um, the other would be if there is a, uh, a tuberculoma where it's causing significant mass effect, but that would be a rare indication because you have a, a possibility of seeding the, uh, the brain even more and, and increase the infection with that. 
So this, uh, this table looks at the prognosis uh, for TB meningitis. So if you remember those stages I told you about, so the first stage with no deficits, second stage very mild lethargy, and then the third stage is kind of the fulminant presentation. So if, you, if you're able uh, somehow to detect meningitis with no neurologic symptoms, then the, uh, the chance of surviving well uh, with no sequelae is quite high. Um, if you catch it in that early symptomatic stage, um, then again, you can still uh, effectively uh, you know, treat the patients and, and prevent neurologic deficit. But if you catch it when they've already progressed to that fulminant stage where this patient had, then the chance of, of uh, a, a positive outcome is very low. So you can see this bottom is the... Uh, um, moderate neurologic deficit, okay? So our patient ultimately remained in the state of uh, akinetic mutism. He was transferred uh, from Vancouver General to Surrey, and then he's ultimately moved to long-term care. Um, and that's kind of the last I've heard of him, and only 19 at the time of diagnosis. So devastating illness. Um, so the last case that I want to talk about um, Again, comes from here at St. Paul's. Um, and so this is a 68-year-old male. And so he uh, previously healthy. And a week prior to presentation, he developed a vesicular rash over the left V1 distribution with associated neuropathic pain. And he began to notice some difficulty with balance um, and self-reported some visual hallucinations. So this isn't the patient, but this is just a, something pulled off of Google Images, but showing essentially how he looked, so a, a classic kind of uh, rash of, of uh, a zoster. Um, and so when we assessed him, his stable vitals, he had his mental status, he was having some difficulty with delayed recall. Uh, his left eye, which is this, the side of the, uh, of the rash, uh, showed some edema with ptosis. The pupil was not reactive. There was um, limited adduction, elevation, depression, so signs of a, of a third nerve palsy. Um, he had altered sensation over the, the left forehead, uh, V1 uh, pattern, mild weakness in the legs, and dropped reflexes in, at the knees. Sensation um, seemed to be reduced uh, slightly in an S1 distribution bilaterally, and he did have some ataxia on heel-shin testing. And so he had a number of neurologic signs. A lumbar puncture was done. Uh, it showed only seven white cells, but he had a different patterns, uh, the pattern of white cells. So we had uh, predominantly lymphocytes suggesting a viral meningitis. Um, protein again elevated and the virology showed positive uh, uh, VZV in the CSF. So this is the imaging um, and essentially there are no major uh, findings within the cerebellum to explain uh, his symptoms. Um, Okay, and then uh, so he's treated with presumed VZV meningitis prior to getting the PCR results. And then he was treated with IV acyclovir, 10 milligrams per kilogram Q8H. So he was re-examined a few days later. Um, and uh, he was uh, on airborne precautions uh, for disseminated VZV at that time. So when I went in to examine him, his cranial nerve assessment was unchanged. His upper extremities were unchanged. But lower extremities, he had developed uh, profound weakness. So his hip flexors were now grade two, knee extensors grade three, knee flexors grade four, and then four distally. Um, reflexes were dropped throughout his lower extremities, um, and uh, he had decreased vibration sense throughout the entire lower extremities now. <clears throat> so he had imaging of the lumbar spine, and what it uh, should show here, what, what I'll try and point out is these are the uh, nerve roots of the cardioquina, and they're, they are enhancing um, in this scan. And I'll show you in the axial, it's a little bit hard to make out, but this is the non-contrast axial view of the roots, and this is the contrast. So you can see the nerve roots are highlighted in this scan. So suggesting he's developed uh, a polyradiculitis from the VZV. Um, so at that time, his acyclovir dose was increased uh, from 10 milligrams up to 15 milligrams per kilogram. And then uh, I believe he ended up getting IVIG for this. So varicella zoster, zoster virus is a herpes virus. As we know, I don't think I need to go through all these details. Um, but it can be re reactivated as the, the uh, zoster rash as he did, as he had. 
Now, the incidence of zoster is about 10 to 20 percent lifetime uh, or lifetime risk. And the risk factors, again, are similar to what we've talked about before. So increasing age, history of malignancy, immune suppression, HIV positivity. Um, recurrent zoster is, is rare. Um, and so it happens about 2.2 per 1,000 person years in unvaccinated and about one time per 1,000 person years in the vaccinated. So there, there may be some evidence for even vaccination with a history of zoster. And so these are the complications of zoster. So at the top, these are the neurologic complications. So multiple different uh, uh, possible symptoms, depending on where the zoster is affecting uh, the nervous system, including uh, cranial neuropathies, Guillain-Barre syndrome, myelitis, et cetera, as well as um, uh, uh, complications in other systems. Now, the complication rate in, uh, in HIV um, it, there's some studies here looking at patients with HIV and, and monitoring for complications of, uh, of herpes zoster. And what you can see here is these two cohorts are, are controls or healthy population. And their complication rate is about 13% or 12%, whereas patients with HIV, their uh, complication rate is 40% or uh, 32%. And so a significantly higher rate of dissemination and, and complications with that infection. Um, and this, again, is looking at um, the risk factors for a complicated course. And so you can see HIV, again, is there. And uh, it's if the viral load is elevated or if there's um, no history of uh, antiretroviral reuse, it's higher. Um, and then in this study, they noted there was an increased risk uh, with patients of African-American uh, heritage. So what is the, the rate of vis v meningitis? And so if we look here, these, this is a series or a, a, a chart review, essentially, of um, aseptic meningitis and then um, uh, identifying the causative organism. And so the majority of these are enterovirus. And HS, or sorry, VZV is, is quite rare, making up about 8% of aseptic meningitic cases. The, ra the diagnosis is made on the typical rash prior to presentation. Um, and then typical symptoms, uh, as we've talked about um, with, with the other case of meningitis. And so the diagnosis confirmed uh, by PCR, um, and, uh, and viral cultures are no longer used just because their sensitivity is not good enough. So here in 12 cases, and this is the table below, but basically 12 cases, uh, none of them uh, had a positive uh, culture, whereas eight of the 12 had positive PCR. So in terms of treating VZV meningitis, there's no randomized controlled trial um, that should, to, uh, to suggest a t particular treatment course. And the recommendations are based on trials for herpes encephalitis. And so the current recommendation is the same as, as with HSV, which is acyclovir, 10 milligrams per kilogram, Q8H. Um, but that can be increased to 15 uh, in, a, in the setting of a complication. Um, and uh, VZV is, is known to have a lower sensitivity than HSV. Okay, so uh, one last thing about VZV. And so this is actually interesting because there's similar studies coming out now looking at Zika virus and, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. But uh, this is a study looking at, at zoster and the risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And this is just a large demographic table showing patients are essentially similar. Um, but what they have, have shown is that in patients uh, who developed uh, GBS, um, so the, the percent of patients that, of this is a large review of multiple patients, but of the controls, only about one in uh, 10,000 developed GBS, whereas if it was uh, with patients had a history of herpes zoster, then it was about two in 1,000. So there was some higher rate of GBS in patients with a recent zoster infection compared to the controls. And so... Um, the thought is that there may be some element of molecular mimicry. So when the, from the immune system uh, fighting off the zoster will then trigger this, this immune response and, and, and cause the Guillain-Barre syndrome. And no particular epitope has been identified. But as I said, this is common in lots of different things. Uh, uh, CMV will trigger a similar pattern, a GBS after CMV or after Campylobacter. So there's no particular um, study addressing the treatment of GBS for, after a zoster, um, but the guidelines are essentially the same as uh, standard GBS, so IVIG or PLEX.
So this patient was treated with IVIG, as I said. He improved uh, his motor function, and then ultimately he was uh, discharged about two months after admission uh, to Holy Family for rehabilitation. Um, and that's it for the three cases. So in summary, these are three um, atypical presentations of meningitis. Um, atypical in that they're more rare organisms, but they have a very typical clinical presentation. And so it, they just need to be in the back of, of your mind when you're seeing patients uh, who present with encephalopathy. Um, and particularly if they have an advanced age, if they have underlying malignancy, history of HIV, or immunosuppression. And then really, as we saw in the cases of TB and listeria, timing is the key. So if you delay diagnosis and delay treatment, then patients can, uh, can have severe um, disability or even death from these infections. And I think that's it. And there's uh, some references. Thank you. Yeah, so for those who can't hear, so the question was whether those, uh, the increased cancer rates in the Listeria studies were divided by type of cancer. No, it wasn't. It was just general rate of malignancy. Yeah. Yeah. I missed it the first one. Yeah. Yeah, I think, it, I'm trying to remember, I think it was from, uh, from Deli Meats, I think it was his exposure, but I can't remember if it was ultimately confirmed or not. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think he was at Grand Rounds. He was at Grand Rounds. Yeah, but it was... <laughs> yeah, no, I can't remember exactly. Um, yeah, it was a couple of years ago now. It was a, it was a case here um, under CTU as well, but I, I, I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Did you treat the gentleman with TB empirically before... Yeah, so when he'd come in... Uh, so. The question was about empiric treatment for the patient with TB. So he had come in with a suspicion of, of TB and uh, because of the, the changes on the, the CT scan. So he, he was in for a bronchoscopy. And then when he declined, he was just put on TB therapy right away. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. 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 Um, no. They said, uh, I think the sample was insufficient uh, what they had mentioned. So he, he did not have a repeat uh, lumbar puncture. He just had the single one at the time. Um, and uh, he was just treated empirically, yeah, without a confirmatory PCR. No, ultimately, CSF came back, yeah. Yeah, but... Right, yeah, so two months later, it came back positive, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And he's under palliative care too. 
he wasn't. But no, he, he wasn't. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, from back to me, they yeah. Yeah. actually yeah. took me up to like six oh, okay. yeah. 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 He would have been a candidate for for time, but just yeah. with my yeah. yeah. minimal deficits and yeah, with a, with a you know without with all everything going on, and then giving him contact with you know, his kidneys, maybe yeah. he was like yeah. 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 Yeah.
your call will be disconnected.